On face to face today is the Winneba born son of a fisherman who rose to become the highest ranked military officer in the country on two different occasions. His political history has seen him traverse the camps of the two dominant political parties in the country amid several controversial movements. We will explore his political thoughts as well as his modern day political leadership. Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mensa is on face to face. Thank you very much, Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mensa. God, God bless you. Thank you. For welcoming us. Now, tell me a bit about your self and your background. You grew up in Winneba. How was Winneba like in the 30s and 40s? I was born precisely in 1937. Don't ask me date of birth because my mother was selling plantain in the market. My father was a fisherman. So, <laughs> those days you were born at home. So, your date of birth isn't recorded or wasn't recorded. What you know, the events, major events, determine when they were born. But the exact date of birth is almost literally impossible to tell. When they were in the, early, early, in the late 30s, early 40s, it was a beautiful place. Most of fishermen, a lot of fish. I mean, life was so easy. You got out, well, the sea was just about 50 meters from my house. Mm. So I could, see the, I could see fish, I mean, fishermen bring the fish from the, from the shore, from my house. We all fishermen, you know, fish was everywhere. So in those days, young people, fishing was the, was the, the, the thing they did. And sometimes some became carpenters and one or two became masons. But otherwise, fishing was the main occupation. Farming, yes, growing vegetables here and there. But it was just fishing all over the place. So in 1945, mm. about eight years old, I said to my father, look, I wanted to go to school. She was bemused. I mean, go to school. He <laughs> don't worry. He was fishing. He going to go to school. And he thought I was joking, but I kept on insisting that I wanted to go to school. But at that time, see, the white people would do something with sense, with re reason. My father's house was about, you could, I could see the school building from my father's house. If I had a school back, I could hear from my father's house. Oh. So, schooling wasn't a problem. There were four schools in Winneba at that time. They were all located in a way that wherever you live in Winneba, you had about a minute, two minutes to walk to school. Not like today, you really ran to go to school from, from, it's crazy. But those, those days, everything was well planned. Life was easy, a lot of food. So, eventually, I mean, when I went to school, my father had trouble. When he came back, said this to him, he said, okay, which one to go? So, go to school. Unfortunately, all the schools there, Methodists, Anglican ECM, English Church Mission School, Amy Zion, and Catholic were all full. Just about the time we gave up hope, the rumor that another school was really founded, Basel Mission School, by missions from Basel in Switzerland. Yes, I could see the school from my house. I remember there was around the corner there. Luckily, myself, those living today, Donata, Dr. Donata, was my classmate in 1945. Eight boys and two girls, ten of us all together, began that school in Winneba. If you know Winneba well, as you go to the seaside, there was a building there. There was a European cemetery, the cocoa shed. We opened our cloth around our necks and went to, went to, I mean, very primitive. But today, if you see it as a UI, primitive or defense staff, from that modest beginning, you wonder how the hell you got to where you are. So it went on like that. You know, the school started, eight boys, then we went on until about 1951, mm. when we had to go to middle form, form one. There was none in Winneba. We had to go to boarding school in Saban, Suedro, Ekwapong, those places. It was an exam, nationwide exam. We sat, and I was selected to go to Saban, Presby boarding school. Wonderful time. That's when I began to grow up. For the first, I left home, walked two miles into Accra River, two miles out two miles in to carry a bucket of water. So every day we walk four miles barefooted in the jungle. The one young people today sit down and want a, a car with, life, with air conditioning. I laugh, I laugh at you. We've gone through hell. Real life, that life prepared you for the life today. It made you tough. That is the life in Ghana in those days. It was tough, but it prepared you for the future. It made you very strong, very tough. So, so at what point did you decide that the army? was for you, considering the newness yes. 
yes, of yes. even the a full skill professional army at the time. That's right. You see, I grew up during the war, the Thirty Nine War, Forty Five. Winneba was a popular place for so you were returning from Burma, from Europe, mm. Americans, British, and Ghanaians coming back from Burma. So, and I had about two or three family people who were in Burma. One of them was a crazy man. I mean, he used to, to run after after his children and beat us. I mean, so, it was very rough. But it was also an exciting life. At some point in time, the, the late Major Akwa, you may have heard Major Akwa, came with the three judges. Mm -hmm. We grew up in the same house. He came back from science in 1957. I didn't enter secondary school. When I left middle school, went to work. I left middle school in 1954. Work for two years to save every person, every penny, lose a penny that I earned to pay my way in secondary school. When I, and I spent three and a half years, it was five years in those days, but I spent three and a half years. Suffered all level 1960. Then, one Mr. Saleh, I have the picture, Saleh Brass, and two British army officers came around the schools. Then, the Tenkuma decided to, to, to rebuild the Ghana army into a full scale national army. And then remove all the British officers from the, mili mili from the military. He had to get a, a young people from Archimonde and France. So they went around the country convincing people like Godfrey to me, like to a good career. So we joined the army. If you are convinced, you actually persuade. Today, people line up in Burma camp, you know, behind, people behind them before they get into the army. We were back to go into the army. And I was fortunate enough to get grade one. You see, when I, you spent three and a half years in school, rather than five years, mm -hmm. I ended up getting grade one. It was very rare in those days. I was doing my exam in 1960 at Makola. There was a big hall there, right in the middle of Makola. And the noise there, only God can. I mean, how the hell you even kept your brain to do mathematics? But I got theorem. <laughs> and with all the music, I kept cool singing and so on. I mean, it was amazing. And I used to walk from Abosoka in the morning, walk to Makola, sweating to go and do mathematics, to go and do literature, to go and do Macbeth and all those things. So life was, you see, you were prepared for hard life. Not like today. Our life was hard. And that mm. right started from your birth. So you prepared, the army was a natural place because you were tough enough to go into the army. So when the British people came around convincing us to go into the army, I was the only one in my class. It was a fighting life. I mean, I mean this, this uncle of mine came back from Burma. And he was, after the war, so get where were misbehaving. They would go to the market, beat people up, and all kinds of So to say to your parents, you're going to go to the army, they say you are a crazy man. I remember a, a friend of mine, I wouldn't mention his name without permission, an old Achimortan. And he told his father, I wanted to go into the army. The father didn't say anything. So one day he was sleeping, and the father came and woke him up about 4 30, 5 o'clock, and asked the son whether anything was wrong with him. He <laughs> <laughs> said, You want to go into the army? No, I'm not. Maybe I have one now. I mean, something. That was how scary the army was. But I wasn't scared. By my camp, you know, for Burma camp. Burma camp was frightening. Even, I mean, today, Trotro go to Burma camp. In those days, who the hell, you go to Burma camp with Trotro, even as a military man, it was scary. So life was it's really, 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 really exciting, tough. Mm. People became very tough because life was rough. You had to, you had to get tough. And I, I have seen your intake. I've seen photos. Yes. And there are a lot of legendary names in there. I saw... Uh, Arnold Quinn yes. in there, who also became yes, a very Quinn. prominent Joe military Feli. officer. Feli yes. was Benasco, in there. Benasco yes, yes, was yes, in yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Early days, these were uh, perhaps the best of the best then, around that time. You know, the competition was, was amazing. I remember coming from, I can't remember where I stayed in Accra, but the whole, the whole selection took one week. And I came to Winneba, not doing well. I don't remember where I stayed, but I'm sure they gave us a place to stay. I'm very sure. I can't remember where I stayed. Mm. In Burma Camp. Never been in Burma Camp before. But it was so scary that you had to be very bold even to go to Burma Camp. And for one week, we began with two exams, English and Mathematics. But luckily for some of us, I've just seen my whole level. So all the maths, all the Pythagoras equations, I was in the head. So I didn't have to think of anything. You know, and then from there, you went to absolute tests and you went to do physical exams where... The whole body was tested. Your mental attitude, uh, attitude, your mental capacity, your physical capacity, so that you are going to be a full man, mentally, physically, emotionally. That took one week. You know, so it, it wasn't it was an easy prospect. 
Because after all, you're going to. I remember there was a major stone when he went to the academy. He to threaten us. He was full of. He's a bully, and he's look. There will be war one day, and we'll be at war. It's not a joke here. War is not a joke. It's not a tea party. It's a serious business. So you were so scared. And un unless you were determined to be in the army, you ran away. Many, many, many people just ran away, even as Sanders, which I, I did later on. So if I look back almost 58 years ago, it been a lot of change. Mm. Change in the Ghanaian, you know, change in the attitude of the Ghanaian. So many things have changed. But sadly, you not feel we are a bit more timid these days, softer? We, we are softer by nature. But as Africans, when, you when I went to science later on, I, I'm sure you'll come to that. I found that the white people, we were much, if it come to boxing, there was a kind of hormone, with a boxer in science. I mean, he used to walk to knock people who were bigger than his, <laughs> twice his weight. We are very strong, but mentally we are, we are weak. If you have, I can walk from here to remember Camp Michael and can walk back. Even though I'm tired, I'll continue walking. The white man will continue walking because he was built, you know, to be tough, to withstand mm. hardship. Yeah, then when it's raining, Ghana will go and hide behind a tree. Are you, are you a soldier if it's raining? You cannot walk in the rain. But besides rain, snow, we trained in snow, in rain. So that's what I'm talking about, toughness. Mm. Okay. We lack comfort, too much comfort. Okay. Now, you had gotten into the army elite class, and you ended up in England. Yes. Studying at uh, the Royal Military yes. Academy, Sandhurst. Yes. Now, yes. that is quite prestigious. It How did you end up there? It was now eye open. I mean, I never dreamt in my youth that you will come when about fishing, end up in Britain, and at Sunnis. It was, it was a dream come true. And you see, I'm somebody who takes life seriously. I don't, I don't joke with life. Mm. Everything of my life is planned. Even my children, it was planned. I mean, there were three, three children. I, don't, I, don't, my wife, I had my wife in front. I don't want four children. I didn't have to buy a bigger car. So three <laughs> children was enough. <laughs> Even that was planned. So in the army, I didn't joke. I was in the army with people from all the best schools, Archimota and Fancy Pemper College. It was one of them. Yes, but I did. I, I went to Pemper College. Yes, yeah, see, see, see. <laughs> <laughs> But I went to Wimber Secondary School. I taught myself. There was no teacher. There was, I saw a graduate teacher my last year of living. We taught ourselves. We, as I said, we were trained to be tough. So you met all these people. But because we have been trained to be tough, it didn't matter to me whether you were an Archimota and Father Prempe College or Snoka. It didn't matter to me. I just proved myself. Luckily for us, today, I mean, I don't know what will happen to me. But my father didn't know anybody in Accra. I had to prove myself. And we had teachers. We had, there were a few Ghanaians who came later. But they were mostly British. They didn't know you. So they look at you from what, how you performed in, in, in the training. And they were watching us. They watched you. They took it. You know, they didn't do I mean, you didn't bribe anybody. So when he was selected, I was selected. I was, I was surprised that myself, Joe Feli, Kwame Mifetu, and uh, Sam Akwensibi, after the whole of four, four, only four were selected to continue our training in Sanhes. Now, you ask about Sanhes is not, it's not, it's, it's a prestigious place. I mean, if you go into history mm -hmm. of military academies, it's probably the top, West Point, it's topmost. So when you were selected to go there to science, then you knew that you had to prove something, you know. And everybody sent their best. Nigerians, Tanzanians, Kenyans, Ghanaians, Ceylonians, Indians. Everybody sent their best. And Ghana sent their best. So you are competing with the best everywhere. So when you end up being selected at the end of your training to be the best overseas of the cadets of your intake, that is the time to be very proud. Not only Ghanaians, but also the Nigerians, everybody. You are judged to be the best officer cadet of that group. And that was you? That was me. So it wasn't just, it was, it was a lot of hard work. Okay. I was there just about a few weeks ago, celebrating our 55th year of commissioning. Just a few, sometime, I think early August, 3rd August, hardly two months ago, I was there. Mm. And the members came back. And I walked there and I saw, and all my colleagues now, they're all balded and some can hardly walk. And so age has taken its toll. But a very proud moment. We went to church. It was a, a lunch. Get got a lunch. I went to church. Church had been there 55 years ago. And prayed for our colleagues, fallen colleagues, including Roger Feli, 
I could even name what the first on one of, from St. Augustine College. And it makes you sad memories and also happiness. A mixture of sadness and so what a church, pray for them. And this was 100 years of the First World War. You also pray for the fallen heroes of the First World War. Mm. Very emotional gathering. To go to Zion, which train was in Churchill. I don't know if you heard about Mr. was in Churchill. You know, there were great names. People like Montgomery was in Churchill and all the characters. Mm. It was, I don't have my picture here, but Lord Montgomery. Not Montgomery, Lord Mountbatten. I'm sure you haven't had Mountbatten. He was commander of the, he was uncle to Prince Charles. And he was the commander of the Allied forces in, in Burma during the Second World War. Ghanaians served under him. Hmm. And talking about Ghanaian soldiers, how lovely they were when he was commanding them in the, in the Far East. So it's, it was a, a, a part of history, emotion, it was a wonderful experience. Oh, okay. Now, I, I wanted to ask you, as a young military officer at that time, I know you had great admiration for Kwame Nkrumah. Yes. You must have been conflicted when he was overthrown in the military coup. I heard of Nkrumah as early as 1949. He was only 40 years old. He was a young man, broke away from the UGCC and formed the CPP. And within two years, I was in a boarding school in Nagunan Sabah, when I heard Nkrumah was coming to Winneba. He didn't have, you know, the only one GBC. It was rumor that was coming to Winneba one Saturday. So I... You didn't get the exit. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that, but I just, I just wanted to see him because like, like, like some phenomenon that was, you know, overwhelming. Like Christ coming to Jerusalem and Zacchaeus climbing the tree, sycamore tree to see uh, Christ. And Christ went and saying, today in your house, I'll spend the night. That memory came back to me. If you go to Winneba, there's a fork road, white road. In the middle of that white road, there was a big almond tree. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I was a young boy about 30, 40, about 14 years old in a boarding school. I came to Winneba and climbed that tree. The crowd was unbelievable to get a glimpse of Nkrumah. And it's an amazing, 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 amazing story. And, but for Nkrumah, people like me wouldn't be sitting down here. I'd have been fishing or something. I'm not saying fishing is bad. I, I wouldn't have written to where I am today. You see, even before Nkrumah, our leadership was unique. People came to serve. They didn't come to lord it over their friends. They came to serve to create a better future. If I come to serve, I want your children to be better than me. Not only my children. This, this was the, 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 the mood in which we came to public service. So what the motto of Sanchez is you serve to lead. Serve to lead. In Ghana, politicians don't serve to lead. They serve to make money and to have the biggest car on earth. That is not the essence of leadership. It just make people better than. Unfortunately, we don't have it now. So Nkrumah was somebody that I knew him as a person. In 1965, I was in Britain studying, mm -hmm. doing a course. And he came to Britain. The last uh, Commonwealth Head of Government meeting before he was overthrown. I saw him with our own eyes. The High Commission then was Mekwesiyama. He stayed in one bedroom. I saw it. Now, not something I read. I was there. I saw it. Today, look at our leaders. You see, I'm, I'm, this is why I admire people like Nkrumah. His simplicity, his, his humility. He didn't have one bedroom. Ah, this, he didn't have any house. Hmm. When he died, I went to Nkrofu to see the mother. If you saw where Nkrumah's mother was staying, not like today. Our leaders do all kinds of things. Well, as I was coming to see, I get emotional about these things. As I was coming to meet you, I was, drove, I was in Jowulu, drove there. So young people in the heat of the sun. I got, I got angry because they should be better than where they are. I was like this. I didn't complain. But if I'm today, I'm former chief of defense staff. And my son is a surgeon at London, uh, what do you call it, City uh, Hospital in London. He's a consultant. So he took me somewhere a few weeks ago. I couldn't believe it that my son. Why couldn't other sons of other people become, other daughters become like this? And don't tell me it cannot be done. I have so much faith. I have so much confidence. It can be done. If you want to know the man, you know, and you young people should read more about Nkrumah. Unfortunately, when Nkrumah was overthrown, we tried to destroy everything about Nkrumah. That's how the thing we did. Documents about him, everything Nkrumah did. In but you, 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 you speak about him and... 
almost reverential terms, but history has also not been very nice to Nkrumah. So he didn't, he wasn't all that good. You see, we haven't been he fair. Tell us the good part. The, no. Tell us the good. He never tell us about the bad. Tell me the bad, and I'll explain the bad. And Nkrumah passed a law. Maybe one of the big people like Dan Kwa died in prison, which was uh, sad. But you see, people who tell the story don't tell the full story. The full story. In 1958, I was at school, just one year at school, in secondary school. When our time was made to overthrow Nkrumah, Nkrumah didn't show any tendency to become the dictator at all. I mean, yeah. now that's wrong. Yet, the father of Nkrumah won power. And he wasn't expected to win power. I mean, a village boy coming from uh, the Western region, that, you know, she didn't win power. So I turned with me to the I was a young boy. I understood it. I, I wasn't young. I was actually about 20, 20, 21 years old, so I wasn't that young. I knew what I was saying. So I turned with me to the him as early as that. And the Queen came here in 19, was it 61, 62? I turned with me to disrupt the coming of the Queen. All sorts of things were done to destroy Nkrumah. So in, the, in response to that, I believe that when Nkrumah passed this law to arrest and detain his opponents, you see, a time was made on 1964, the Amitepe coup Police my guard him, shot him. All these, you see, if you try to kill me, I will defend myself, wouldn't I? But let's tell the full story. To know why Nkrumah did suddenly, I'm not saying Nkrumah was an angel. He was a human. And to err is human. I'm not an angel. I, I, I commit... Uh, you know, sins as, as human, like everybody else. But let's give him due credit for what he did. In Kumar's overthrown, I was chairman of Georg, which had 10 subsidiaries, steelworks, pharmaceuticals, oil mills, but electronics. We destroyed almost everything. We should have sustained those things. Black Star Line, Ghana Airways. Young people today would not be roaming the streets and begging and selling dog chains on the street. If you destroy them, this is the one thing that hurts me so much so. The young people today have de denied a future. Imagine, Ghana should have about 100 ships, young people you know, cruising the oceans. Ghana should have about 50, 50 airway, uh, airlines. We saw everything because Nkoma started them. That is, that is criminal. You are watching Face to Face with my guest, Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mensah, retired. When we return from our break, we'll have a conversation about his days as CDS, politics, and leadership. Keep watching. Wherever the weekend sporting action happened, we will bring it to you here on Scorecard. Every goal, every dunk, every punch, the winning strides, and the winning volleys. Come international media, he said, look, wait, sit and wait. Let me have a meal with my people. <laughs> and I think that that's the same cool, it's the same organization he brings to the field every time I've seen him play. He looks to me like somebody who's played over 50 cups already. Okay. But this guy, He's barely played over 25 cups for the national team. All of the weekend's action in one place. Scorecard, every Sunday at 8 p.m. prompt on CTTV. Welcome back to Face to Face as we continue our conversation with Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mesa. Now, Brigadier... You, I, I know you loved Nkrumah and you've spoken about what we missed and what we could have learned. But you moved on after yes. those periods and you rose through the army yes. to become a two-time CDS. Yes. How does one become a two-time CDS? Well, Isn't one enough? To do that, let me take you a few years back very quickly. Mm. In 1966, we had a school which toppled Nkrumah. I was a captain then. But moved pretty quickly between then and 1979. A time of the Rollins uh -huh. June 4 revolution. I'd gone to Staff College in Canada, the middle level school for officers of the major rank, Captain Major. I'd come back in 1975, I spent another year in India at the highest, one of the highest training schools in the world, wonderful place in New Delhi. And came back as chief of staff at the time of the of the June 4 revolution. It, I don't know how you remember, but in 1977, mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit too, uh, too far back that you may, you may not remember, but I had done a coup in 1972 mm -hmm. and was head of states. And in 77, 
by seventy seven dollars of you know commotion in Ghana coming from doctors, teachers, a lot of you know, the regime had become you know more cumbersome. I had to get rid of the regime, the military regime. And it was unwilling to hand over power. I remember my, I myself, you know, I made you, at a meeting, a top level meeting, remember come, put, put an idea that it's about time the military left politics and went back to barracks. Yeah, then our uh, chamber wasn't too pleased. So we were posted, I was posted soon after that to go to Uganda as High Commissioner to Idi e. Amin, which I refused to go. And then I made you, went to Zambia and so I had a commissioner there. So in 1978, the military thought that enough was enough and Achampo was removed. Yenakubu became the head of state. Yenamidu came back from Zambia to become the chief of defense staff. Mm -hmm. Then I was posted to the staff college at Tishin, at Commandant. So during that period, a few months after my posting, three, four months, the June 4th took place. And it didn't have too many senior officers like we have today, four or five brigadiers. So myself, Jenna Quenu, a few others were there. The military high command at that time, being the junior officers who had taken power from the um, Akufo government, decided that I should become chief of defense staff. Okay. If you want to know why, from the one you meet, President Warren is asking. What he said was that among the officers that was available, I was the best person to become chief of defense staff. So I left my job as a commandant to became chief of defense staff. It was sometime in July 19, but early, I think July 1979. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 um, within, within a matter of three months, elections had been held to have a power to the PNP under President Liman. Yeah. So they went ahead with the handover, and the man became president. Sometime in September. Within the next three, four months, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, it wasn't possible for me, for me to stay with the government. It wasn't possible. Why wasn't it possible? You see, you have principles in life. This life, see, people live today, you, you, you go and see MP, MP, NDC <laughs> posters there, waiting for NDC and people to fall, for them to come to power. And people do the same thing. Now, I have principles in life. I can go back and fish. If I, you know, I, I don't mind putting down the job of chief of defense staff, which I did. And you come to that. So, I was, I was difficult. I was, I, the principles of military, I will never bend. I will never bend them. Was it just not a matter of you didn't like him, man? No, 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 no. I've never hit anybody. I just felt... See, we had the Minister of Defense, Master Raleigh Poku. You may have heard it, Raleigh Poku. He thought that, uh, being a minister, he was in charge of the Minister of Defense. I said, you're not in charge. I'm the Chief of Defense Staff. The President is the, the Commander-in-Chief. You are representing him. So you have no, no power over me. There was basic principles of disagreement mm. about how to manage the military. And that ended up with me being removed or sacked in November 1979. So what happened? I, I wouldn't go to details, but I was removed and I went to have a big farm. I mean, I told you before, I had a rough life. So anything I can fish, I go back to fish. I was a fisherman, I was a farmer. So I had a big farm at uh, Hacho. A very big farm. If you, saw the, if you, if you came my, to my home in those days, you see food everywhere here. Plenty of food. I don't, as I said, I don't fear hard work. I, I love hard work. So I went back and farm until 81st, the 1st December 1981. President Rawlings seized power again. Mm -hmm. I think my farm, when I heard my name already, that I wanted to become chief of defense staff for the second time. That's why I became chief of defense staff. He thought that I was not properly treated the way we were removed from power. So I came back. And then Queen became the Army Chief of Staff. I'm just rushing through this. Yes. So that's how the two times. So Thank two times because when I came two times, but I myself, I didn't stay long with President Rollins too. Yes, and I wanted to ask you that. <laughs> I have you, to, you, see, you left Liman, went to farm, Rollins brought you back, and then and, you and left, left Rollins. On a you matter see, of principle, you've never spoken yes. about. But today I'll push you. Yes. Why no, did you no, leave no. Rollins? I, mean, I don't have to hide it. First of all, it was difficult to be a very senior officer, to 
work among soldiers and young officers. When you get to that level there, your training, your background, your experience is far, far outweigh those that you're working with. So they, will not, they don't understand you. you <laughs> he said something. But you were CDS. Yeah, were CDS. But for example, for example, you were CDS. Then, but they are, your commanders, the government was made up of captains and majors. Okay. Alan Rawlings was a captain rank. And you cannot be a brigadier serving captains. It doesn't work that way. It's an anomaly. So it didn't, you know, and, and for the sake of Ghana, I stayed in, in place. Because I felt that being critical in that position, anything I did of an impact on, the, on Ghana, anything I did, people were seeing me as de facto head of state. Because they thought, they thought you were a level-headed person. And so once I left, I knew Ghana would be in trouble. So I stayed on and you could see the signs. No, no, you, 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 you. Uh, when, when you have been my age, and you have been through all these schools in the world. You've been to, you've, you've done studies of Pakistan, that you can and you know Musharraf and all these things going on around Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi. You learn so much, you know, so much that you can see things coming. So I knew that. I mean, given the chaos that was happening, mm. I don't know whether I, you, were, you weren't around. We were around those days. A bit. <laughs> a bit, but you wouldn't remember much. Yes. You were too young to remember. But when you have young officers, and things that happened by ordinary soldiers, they were so horrible. It tried to, it tried to quell them down. Because you knew that if you left the scene, then what went on? The horrible that went on, if I'm to describe them today, I mean, you know, they, they were too horrible to be described. But I knew within me that if I left, Things will break down. I was in this very room, this very house. I woke up at 12 o'clock and began writing my letter of designation. I woke up at 12 o'clock and began writing. You haven't seen a copy before. I'll, I'll give you a copy. Mm. Three and a half page letter, giving reason why I resigned. What did he say? I, what did you say? We so have to summarize it. That, you know, no, I mean, what did Rawlings say when you gave him the letter? He wrote back to me. That letter, it took 10 years to read it. Ten years for you to read the letter. Yes, I put it down. I went to Britain. Ten when I came, I read the letter. I read, I read the letter. I never read it. So you left without reading the letter. Then Chairman Rollins <laughs> sent I'm, you. Just, I can tell you for a fact. I can quote the Quran, the Bible. I never read the letter. It's when I came back because I knew that the the emotion was like that. If I read it, I may be so angry or something. So I just put it down. When I came back ten years later, I took it and read it. And it's good I didn't read it. Mm. Let me ask you this. You talk about you seeing the potential for damage based on the junior officers who were in charge at that point. For that face, what, what, what is your overall view of what that regime came to achieve for Ghana? No, they, they didn't come to... They, if, you, if, you, if you remember very well, it was a house cleaning exercise. They came to... The, Rollins or the, or the Air Force said that the crimes of our temple regime, when, when criminals were not properly punished, if you go back, you see mm -hmm. that they went away with murder, with looting. Okay. That's why a champo and others were lined up and shot. Because the claim was that they hadn't paid for their sins. So there wasn't a regime that came to do any good. All they came is to, clean, is to, is to punish those who they thought should have been punished. That was that's the reason they gave. So they didn't come. That's why they had the power to demand. Mm -hmm. I told Lemantu had not run the country properly. So, barely two years, two, two years, few months, they came back to remove Le Leman. But judging from my knowledge, ex training experience, I knew that from the early signs that this regime could not run Ghana. But it did for 19 years. No, they, I mean, well, okay, okay, let's, now let's, the second phase. Let's, let's second, after June 4th, after June 4th, I was going to actually, not June 4th, after June 30th, when the judges were killed. I wasn't going to go. I was, actually, I was actually hanging on to try to change things, hoping that things could be changed for the better. But when the judges, the judges and the army officers were taken hostage and, and killed, that was something I couldn't stomach. It was like the, 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 the needle that blew the camels back. I couldn't take any more because for for 
us to take human life because you are in government. That I couldn't take it. That was the, this was in my letter. I said, that was that, that which I will give a copy. That, when that came, I said, now enough is enough. Got up and resigned. In fact, I didn't resign immediately. I resigned about November 22nd, about four or five months later, after June, after the 13th of June. Because evidence was coming out that people in the government were involved. Amati Kui and others were involved in the killing. People in the government. And I couldn't belong to a government whose members are accused of murdering people. I mean, I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. So for my own reputation, my own image, I had to quit. Okay. Now, the next major political phase for you was when you emerged with Nana Redakwe Kufa, the U.S. campaign manager, in 1998. And, Where did you meet him? When, when, when I came back, I went to Britain from 83 to 93. Went back and came back from 94. I left Ghana for 10 years. Mm. When I came back and watched television, what I saw didn't make me happy. I mean, I'm always trying to make Ghana. I mean, it was an impossible task, but not for want of trying. The Ghana should be a better place than it is today. So I used to get angry with myself, watching TV, and thought that all the MPs were just rubbish. They were typical military officers, and you were the best. You can't go to science and feel that anybody is better than you. I have said, look, it's all the noise you're making. Nobody is hearing you. Why don't you get to Parliament and make the noise there? But I left the PNDC, which of, out of which NDC had come. So I couldn't go back to join the NDC. Even though my natural home was the NDC. And what I mean by this is that, look at my background, where I'm coming from. Eh? I should belong to a people's government. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Yes, I do. The NTP is an elit elitist government. It's an elitist government. Nkuma chose Brianna Boys, Kobodi Se, Kofi Bakun, Nkumsa, and all these characters, people teachers. That's where I belong to. But CPP had been decimated. I couldn't go back to CPP. So I, I go to the N MPP. And that's when I stood for a 1996 election for Winneba. And I was telling them things that I was too naive, too simplistic, too innocent to think that without giving them money, they would vote for me. There's a problem with Ghana. I said, look, I'd be chief of defense staff. My children are grown up. I don't need the money I need. I will set up a, a trust to train young people from the town who were clever, who didn't have parents to look after them. I will put money down to educate them. It was music to their ears that I didn't promise money. But I, I, last thing I would do is give anybody money to vote for me. I would never do that. But I'm coming to save you. Why should I bribe you to come and save you? They told you, you go to power to make money. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to come and literally save the people. I have a boy in this house. I asked him, when I come, who feeds for you? He feeds before I feed. You can ask him. You see, this is how we were taught, trained as sunnies. You serve to lead. Mm. So, when I went to the MPP, I lost the election to Mr. Mark Hammer, a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. But it was like a, a, a wonderful competition. It wasn't insult and no, I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. Later on, when Anakovado became lead, tried to become leader of the M MPP in 1998, he tried to be, become his campaign manager. So I've known him more than any other politician. Mm. I've known him very well. Still, I, I take him to be a good friend of mine. But you see, politics and the military, they don't, they don't mix. Yes, because you the, fell out again. Yes, with see, the they, see, because, because the, the way they are doing a policy, it's not the way I want it to be done. I want us to come and rather than coming to make money. This is why I built O'Reilly. I built Winnie Sibar Secondary School Block. I built uh, 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 Saban uh, Presbyterian School. I built Konyaku Police. I built, uh, I did about six, seven buildings. The, the car I'm driving, if you see the car, not this Benz. This Benz 24 years old. 24 years old. 42 years old, 24 years old, and 20 years old. My cars are old. I could have bought a Land Cruiser. I said, no. Land Cruiser doesn't serve any purpose. If somebody's daughter or the son is, is, is deficient of some money to become somebody, why don't you help that person? That is, that's been my nature from birth. My mother was like that. My mother would cook at this time. And if you came, they said, go have you eaten. Sit down, eat. I'm telling you, it's in my blood. This, you don't learn them. It's in your blood, you have it or you don't have it. So that is why that is why you see me being different. That I, I know I resign and go away. When ABP people got power with the Mexico Four, as I I I I supported them. I voted for them. 
And I'm now beginning to understand politicians more and more. That they don't come for the good of the people. They come for themselves. So I will never be a politician. I can never be. And But but you served as National Security yes. Coordinator under Kufo. Uh, National Security Advisor. Advisor under Kufo. Advisor under President Mills. No, President Mills. No. Under Mills. You under didn't Mills. do that under Kufo. No, no, I did not for the MP. They offered my job. I, I took the job. I didn't do it. But you went with Mills. Yes. Well, why? Uh, so you had moved from PNDC, MPP, back, back to, to yes. your... You see, Ruth, if you watch, if you watch my character very well, I'm looking for quality. I'm looking for money. Mills was quality. Of course, he was. I met the Mills for the first time at uh, M Plaza Hotel, hmm. and I liked him. I liked him because of his humility. You know, he was so humble. So when he announced that I wanted to stand for the NDC, he came to see me in my house here. That shows the humility. Yeah, Mr. President, more well. May your coffee happen. Coffee means, I mean, uh, you know, I give I have a small money. It's not the it's not the money, the size, the spirit behind the money is what's important. That you have my support to become president. Mm. And and when when and, and I never regretted when he became president. I was the first president he appointed as an official of his government. His advisor, General, but I was I mean, sure, what what do you want to do? He asked me, and I said, Mr. President, my my surgeon all my life. I never done a civilian job. I want to be, I mean, my training put me in a job life where I would be advised on matters of security and national security. Period. He said, You have it. And, and, and that I was said, it. Yes, and I, and I served him with, with, with distinction. I remember, very, see this, you see, unfortunately today, today, I regret there are people who are not fit for the job they are doing. And they are messing up the work. But isn't it a sign changing times? You you perhaps belong to an era of hardened military men yes. and intelligence, but yes. perhaps we are now dealing with a, a different era of intelligence. But even, you got to, even, with the old, even with the old generation, I'm saying that you want to appoint somebody into a job, not a job for the boys. You must be that the person has some competence. Let's take just take food situation in Canada today. Mm -hmm. It is critical. Critical, look, I traveled to Konyaku the other day, not about three, four weeks ago. See the, the police station I built. From Akoti Junction, the Winneba Road, you turn right towards Konyaku. I was saddened by the fact that I didn't see one foot crop, 15 miles stretch. How? All the youth there are in Accra selling dog chains. We want to get the money. Instead of buying title, we buy, we buy land cruises. Mm -hmm. So there is something wrong with the system. There's something definitely wrong. And... You, 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 you've taken this criticism to a lot of levels. Let me ask you this. Clarify this for me. Yes. Were you fired by Mahama, reassigned by Mahama, or you just quit? No, I mean, the truth of the matter was that I served Mahama with all this loyalty and distinction. I'm telling the truth. When he became president, for no apparent reason, you see, there are people, for me, mm. I like one of because I'm clever. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can boast about it. I'm not stupid. So if you are, if you are like me, I like you. And Muhammad is like you. No, I'm coming to that. I haven't come to that. I haven't I'm saying that if you are like me, because I want quality. I want quality. I don't want any, 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 you know. Uh, so somehow, with the males, I got on with him excellently. Hmm. You are very modest. I'm a very modest person. Extremely modest. He was very modest, so we got on very well. Some of uh, President Mills, sorry, President Mahama was vice. He got on very well. Somehow, he became president after the death of President Mills. He, th he thought he should change the whole team. You think of Black Star Line. Then the manager says, he wants to change some more, change everybody, but new team. You will fail. You can't do it. But he's, uh, from what of his team now, says? I'm coming to answer your I'm, okay. I'm, 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 answer, I'm coming to answer your question. But I want to give you a bit of background so people understand it. Okay. So I haven't changed the whole lot. Everybody was changed. E.T. Mesa, Babin, uh, everybody changed. Now you can't take over a team, whether a football team or army, army, army command, and change, well, you will fail. Because you need a bit of experience to merge with youth. Because the old order changes, yielding place to the new. If you read it, Twelfth Night, which I read in school, it changes. So you, the old people there, mix them with the young. 
the youth, the white person melts it, our deputies, that black person and whatnot. So when people like me fade away, they take over. Mm -hmm. Knowledge from university doesn't qualify to become a minister. I'm telling you, it's not enough. Because you have a degree in economics, you can cite all the economic theories. When you go to the ground, it's different. It's different. People are working on the street. They're hungry. You say you are economic. Go and solve the problem. So you, you let the youth with, with the theory. Eh? Mm -hmm. Stay with the young pe old people. And before you go, pick the experience, the knowledge. Knowledge is not books you read in school. Knowledge is experience over time. You can't be in the world all these years and you haven't learned anything. No. I grew Kazaba in Aboba. They were big like my ties. It wasn't in any, any, any Greek book. It's experience. So it's not wrong to, to change the whole team and bring a new set of team, a set of And they, they mess up everything. That but was your estimation. You that's think right. Mahama messed up? If, well, if, if you are power, you are power, mm -hmm. and lose power, you lose the power. Opposition, Nana Kuba didn't win the election. They did which lost power. That is your estimation of what happened It is what is important. Go and check your politics. That opposition parties don't win power. The government in power will lose power. You have everything to keep power. You lost it. You think so, that Muhammad But, but I've, come, I've, I've, I've even answered your question yet. Let me come answer your question. Answer the question. You ask, well, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, that's not the case. Why well, I'm opposed to him coming back. I was sacked. I didn't do a coup d'etat to come back. I want to imagine a Kazaba farm. There are several things we can do to build Ghana. You see, I was going to fishing. I went to school. Became a soldier. I became a politician, partly. So if we have lost power, I'm saying that to try and come back, but at all costs, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not, a, look, people have lost power. And if you go back to history, 1980, President Carter lost power to President Reagan. He's alive. If you Google, he's about 90 something years. Yes. He's still doing so much good to mankind. I left power. The man sacked me. I want to have a big farm. I used to bring tractors to Kazava, to Labadi, to uh, myself. So I'm saying that you can serve mankind in many other ways. But because we have lost power, we are struggling to come back to power as if the power is the only job to do. NDC are waiting for MPP to fall to come back to power. They wonder about what, what good to do to, do to Ghana. So was MPP when MPP, NDC was in power. Try to bring them down. That is not politics. That's dirty politics. You are watching face to face on City TV. We are having an exciting and very revealing conversation with a two-time CBS Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mesa. Face to face. We'll be right back. It's engaging, detailed, and loaded with factual and incisive analysis. It's The Big Issue, your preferred Saturday morning news and current affairs analysis program on City TV. Tune in this and every Saturday at 9 a.m. and hear the newsmakers discuss the top issues for the week. At that time, at that time, Charlotte was complete. I'm not defending Charlotte. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the way we are, we behave like hypocrites and ostriches in this country. At that time, she was the, a perfect person. It's The Biggest You with Selma Donu on City TV, this and every Saturday at 9 a.m. Let me ask you this. Do you regret, and perhaps I, that would be a, a, a poor choice of words, considering that on my way into your house, yes. I saw that you have put it in uh, a frame, that controversial statement you Which made one? when you were opening already <laughs> secondary school, that if the kitchen is too hot for you, <laughs> but get out. Do you regret that statement? Speed, experience a big, a big uh, whatever. Look, what, what I have. You took what, a lot of heat. No, no, what I, what, but the heat, but, but it's tough. I mean, but like crocodile the body, very tough. The heat will hit back and reflect. In hindsight, you don't regret no, it? No, no, you cannot pierce through my, my body. You see, <laughs> You've got to be tough. This world is a rough world. It's a very rough world. And what Ghanaians lack, which I regret, is the courage to speak their mind. I was a captain. I was taken to Nkrumah's office. And I done something, and my boss was so scared of Nkrumah that I had to be taken to Nkrumah's office. In 1966, Kutoka then, 
who overthrew Nkrumah, called me to his office a day after the coup. You see, when, when we were controversial, and everything I did was based on logic, not of hatred. So I could explain to you why I did what I did, based on my logic. And they said, go away, go. Because they found nothing wrong with what I did, based on logic I in, 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 enunciated. Mm. So I'm saying that what we lack in Ghana, which you young people should wake up, because soon, if Kofani and others are gone, I mean, I'm older than Kofani, he's gone. So, that's the wake up, Yenna is gone. What do you do? Wake up and save this country. Because you are things wrong with the country. You are all going, be I the moon, be I quiet. Nobody wants to talk. Because you know things are wrong. But nobody is able to talk. What is so, wrong now? Can't you MPP see? is working, <laughs> they say. I'm not saying that. They're working, but if, look, I, I didn't do physics in school. I was too poor. I didn't have teachers. But work done is effort time distance. I taught my children. The doctor was teaching them. I didn't do physics, but I learned in science. If you are working and they're sweating, but nothing happened, you are doing nothing. Work done is effort time distance. If I move this, this chair, I moved and I'm sweating and, I, and they say it's still there. I don't know where. And that's how I you describe the MPP. No, no. <laughs> that they are sweating, no, but nothing that? is happening. <laughs> We are planting food, food for, for jobs and what? You should be excited. You like <laughs> growing things. Exactly. <laughs> you should. Look, it's like growing food for, for, food for what? Planting for food and jobs. They have shared the numbers. Almost and, half a million farmers are You have are seen them. This. They are farming. Yes. They haven't shown the picture of the farms. <laughs> so you, don't, look, you are not buying not these things. things. Robert, let them not be full, though. <laughs> you make me laugh. <laughs> Let them not be fooled. That's my. <laughs> you see, we are being fooled, unfortunately. Co the coconut here. Well, how much one coconut? How much? <laughs> These days on the market, uh, two cities. No, more than two cities. You are not living in Ghana. The big ones are more than yes, two cities. 2.5. Some of them are even three. That's a part of my house in Canton. Where you are? This one, this one, this one, 50 pesos. So, in terms of things are getting better. You want to tell the me, government says they are even committed. if I am blind. Even if I'm dumb, I can feel my stomach, there's hunger in my stomach. You see, the things are, are rough. You go to Winneba, I come from Winneba. There's a university there. President Kupada was there to uh, the new, the new, the new vice, -chancellor. vice chancellor. I didn't go. I, mean, I didn't know it. I mean, invite, I'm going to invite them. Nobody invited me. I don't really care. And I was going to secondary school. You walk in the town. I don't know how they eat in the school. I meet the undergraduate. I ask them, what do you eat? It's terrible. You tell me there's food. Where is the food? I can, I'm not blind. I probably with my eyes, but I can say that when you're by the night. Look, something's wrong with the country, and we need to have courage to speak up. That mm -hmm. is, to me, my biggest, you know, again, you, the young people. Because, look, at, our, at my age, at my age, you have a picture of Ghana Military Academy. Mm -hmm. More than 25% are no more. So, my chance are, chance are that, look, I, I also be following pretty soon, or not be pretty, sometime, very soon. When we go, that's why I, I thought this, this is our thing is very interesting. When I wake up, I dread about the future. What happened to Ghana? Governor did his best, but he's gone. Mm -hmm. He said he's gone. We are going one by one. So I said, how? You can't even feed ourselves. We can't. I'm telling you, we can't feed ourselves. I had a big fan at Kwabenya. If you, if you went there, you wouldn't believe that Yanunu Mensa holding my cutlass. Nobody wants to farm because the government doesn't support the young people to farm. They, they say they are supporting them. But when you go to the farm and you don't see young people, they're all in, on the street in Accra. Like Bob Cole said, if you're in Taban and Kabada, man, if you your home was good, why are they in Accra? So let's don't pretend as if, as if all is well. Let's be, have the courage to speak the truth. You like education. You've been building schools. The first yes. time I, I heard your name mentioned along with the Riley Secondary School, I yes. thought your family owned the school. No, I not. But no, you just I, built yes. schools. I, I, no, not schools. Not, not only schools. So many things. I got your call because I paid the school fees for it. I don't. I didn't know it anywhere. You see, this kindness, this thing, you can't go and learn leadership and all. You don't learn. You can't go to school and learn to be kind. You can. You lie. You can never learn. It's inside your blood. It's in your genes. I built O'Reilly and so many schools, O'Reilly, in Saban, in Saban, uh, Presby, in Saban, Islamic School, um, Konyaku Police Station, mm -hmm. Konyaku uh, Clinic, Winneba Secondary School, a big block, the Rampo Secondary School, and the uh, uh, Mori. When I said I built I didn't go to sit in the Lankusa. If you say pushing a wheelbarrow, 
You won't believe, you won't believe that you're not the one pushing the wheelbarrow. You won't believe it. But I used to push wheelbarrow to teach young people how to lead to serve it to people. This is why we don't teach. You go, you come and start with the land cruiser. They tell us you go and we should go and work. Get out and go and work as well. Get out and go and work. Ask my boy. You ask him. What do you, how do you find your master? You teach it before you go. Until we, you see, that's leadership by example. Mm. By example. But the, the the young people are on the street. There, I, I feel so sad about them. I feel so sad. I look at them. They look like they are worn out. I feel sad. Well, you don't have leaders who understand them. But unfortunately, the people who are in power don't feel it. Are you hopeful? I'm scared. I'm worried. I'm scared. I'm telling you, I'm scared. When I look at the youth of youth today, and they're having children. They themselves can't get the place to sleep. They're having children. Those children, the children, children, where are they going? We have free senior high school today. We have you thought of what to do after the senior high school? Have you thought about it? Have you thought about it? Where they will go? No, they need to produce them, produce them. That is not the sense of education. To make life better. It's not happening. Mm. But people who are supposed to sit up and stand up and be, you know, accountable to what they say, they are scared for what I don't know. What are you, what are you scared of? The country, I'm, I keep on saying it, it's obvious. When you go on the road there, you turn and see those who are selling on the road there. What are they selling? Dog chain. Something. I feel sad. I just said, please. I just said, uh, uh, oh yeah. They come to wipe my windscreen. I switch, I switch on the windscreen. Yes, they're going to put some soapy water on my windscreen. Look at the death streets. And we say, do you know what's going on? What are you waiting for? And they're going to Europe. Now to look to uh, barricaded their countries. Italy, yes, Italy. If you are in Italy, you pay the fool, they will send it back to your own country. If you go to stay. Yesterday, yesterday. Austria, Sweden, Germany. Britain, skinheads were fighting. All these indications that things are getting rougher and rougher. But well, we seem not to see it. That's my worry. That's my worry. And my advice to you, the young people, to wake up and secure the country for yourself. I mean, I don't have a, a future. At 81 plus, you think I have a future? My people, they're all gone. So, but I worry when I'm gone, what happens to me? My children, grandchildren, and your children, your grandchildren. What I worry. You can take a loan. To be, be paid in what? 100 years. What, where will we be? Who will be here to pay the loan? Answer me. Who will be? My answer is that thank you very much, <laughs> Brigadier General Joseph Nunu Mensa. It's <laughs> been very, very educational sitting with you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I hope, I wish we could have just gone on and on and on, but time will not allow us. It's been a pleasure being with you uh, on Face to Face. My name is Gofeda Kutubuafo. See you on another episode of this great show. Have a good day.